So on C8, all right, so this is the female reproductive system. So let's look at it real quickly here. Here's the ovaries. Uh, these are the fallopian tubes. This is the uterus. The uterus is made up of an inner layer called the endometrium. Endo means inner, metrium means uterus. And we're going to see that blood vessels grow in the endometrial lining every month in a woman. And those growth of blood vessels are to prepare the woman in case she gets pregnant so that it can nourish, the blood vessels can nourish an embryo. Uh, the outer, thicker outer layer is called the, called the myometrium. Myo means muscle. That's the, the metrium means uterus. That's the outer muscular layer of the uterus. The purpose of the muscle, of course, is to contract and push the baby out during childbirth. Of course, sometimes the muscle can contract even when one, uh, one's not giving birth. That's called uterine cramping. Uh, because you can have cramping in a, a calf muscle in your leg, and you can have cramping of the muscle in the wall of the uterus. Uh, the bottom part of the uterus is called the cervix, and it opens into the vagina, or vaginal canal, or birth canal. Uh, we're going to be seeing that uh, each month, uh, if, if a woman doesn't get pregnant, uh, the blood vessels that form in the endometrial lining are shed uh, out uh, the vaginal canal, and that's called having a period or menstruation, that shedding of the blood vessels. And obviously, you're only going to shed the blood vessels if you don't have to nourish an embryo. Uh, I remember reading many years ago in a 19th century physiology book, a physiology book written in the late 1800s, uh, that they described uh, menstruation, having a period, as the womb, the uterus, the womb, crying because it didn't get pregnant. And, uh, and, and I actually kind of thought, I like that. I like the way that was phrased, because it was kind of gentler than saying, you're bleeding, uh, if the wounds just cry. Uh, so uh, anyhow, this uh, is a cutaway view of the ovary. And here's an enlarged view of the ovary. So let's take a look at this enlarged view. And we're going to see more diagrams as we go on. Now, uh, <clears throat> what I've done is I've written, and I'll be explaining this day one right here. And we'll be explaining exactly what day one is uh, shortly. And then uh, right here where it shows released egg, I wrote day 14. And right about here, uh, just uh, around, just below where it says immature follicles, I wrote day 28. We're going to be seeing that there's monthly cycle, this so-called menstrual cycle in women lasts about 28 days, about one month, about four weeks uh, normally. Uh, now. The uh, between, uh, uh, and if it lasts 28 days, from 1 to 14 to 28, we divide this cycle into two halves. We divide it into the two weeks before, uh, and when the egg pops out on day 14, that's called ovulation. That's the egg popping out. Egg pops out, and where does it go? It actually enters the fallopian tube. So the two weeks leading up to ovulation are called the pre-ovulatory or follicular phase. That's what it's called. The two weeks after ovulation, day 14 to day 28, is called the post-ovulatory or luteal phase. The post-ovulatory or luteal phase. So we've got two phases here. Now, what happens during the first two weeks, the so-called pre-ovulatory? And obviously, it's called pre-ovulatory because that means before ovulation. What happens is there's a hormone from the pituitary gland called FSH. FSH is from the pituitary gland. Now, I know that it, as I start to explain it, it's right. What is it? Where is it from? Where is it? Okay, it's all written down for you. Let's jump ahead, and I'll just show you. Take a look at page C11. On C11. On C11, we wrote FSH. What does that stand for? Follicle stimulating hormone. Page C11. Follicle stimulating hormone. Where does it come from? It's secreted by the pituitary gland, the master endocrine gland of the body. And uh, more precisely, it's secreted from the adenohypophysis or anterior lobe of the pituitary. 
Now, if you learned that the, uh, in your anatomy class, if you, whether you learned it or not, if you did learn it and remember it, uh, uh, if you can remember, there's two lobes to the pituitary, an anterior and a posterior lobe, an adenohypophysis and a neurohypophysis. If you, whether or not you remember that, or you do remember it or don't remember it, don't worry about it, we're going to be reviewing that in much greater detail later on in the course. Uh, we're going to get into much greater detail as far as that pituitary gland. But uh, I am mentioning it, that's part of the pituitary that secretes this hormone. Think about what the name of the hormone is. Names mean something. Follicle stimulating hormone. This hormone stimulates the growth of something called an ovarian follicle, something that's in the ovaries, an ovarian follicle. Not only does FSH stimulate the growth of an ovarian follicle, it also stimulates the follicle cells of that ovarian follicle to secrete estrogen. So before we go any further, let's go back to our picture on C8. So we're back on C8. So now we know FSH is a hormone circulating in the bloodstream. It causes a tiny ovarian follicle to grow, it stimulates it to grow. Technically, these little ovarian follicles are called primary follicles, and they mature into what are called secondary follicles, and they mature into what are called graphene follicles. We're not going to worry about all the terminology that they give for describing how it's growing. Uh, and uh, each month, in, mo in most women, FSH will cause just one ovarian follicle to develop. Uh, we believe that the ovaries alternate, so that if one month, this month, uh, the FSH causes an ovarian follicle to develop in the right ovary. And the next month, the FSH will cause uh, an ovarian follicle to develop in the left ovary. Uh, could an ovarian follicle develop in both ovaries simultaneously? It could. And if the, the, both ovaries ovulate around the same time, and a woman has intercourse, she has twins, right? Because that means both eggs uh, are fertilized. These are fraternal twins. It's just like two sisters, two, a brother and a sister. They could be different genders. They're two separate <laughs> eggs being set, as fertilized by two separate sperm. But the most women usually ovulate one egg at the same time. Most, the, the twins are not, you know, that's not common. Uh, okay, so um, FSH not only causes this ovarian follicle to develop, it causes, and I think I drew an arrow, it causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. Now, what, what is an ovarian follicle? An ovarian follicle is a structure that contains the ovum or egg, and it's surrounded by what are called follicle cells. Together, that's called an ovarian follicle. FSH causes this to grow, and it causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen into the bloodstream. So notice that this pituitary hormone is affecting uh, the cells of the ovaries. It's affecting the ovaries. Obviously, these follicle cells have FSH receptor sites, right? Because obviously, FSH is activating those follicle cells to do something, causing them to secrete estrogen. So we've ta have we talked about how hormones, right, and neurotransmitters activate receptor sites, and that causes things to happen. So uh, there are FSH receptor sites on these cells. All right, so this is what happens during the first two weeks of the cycle. Now, the next two weeks, beginning on day 14, a different hormone from the pituitary gland is released. This second hormone released from the pituitary gland is called LH. And LH, released from the pituitary, is what causes ovulation. And it also affects something else. Before we go any further, let's just show you what's all written down for you. Let's uh, take a look on page C11. And on C11, what did we write about ovulation? Ovulation, we wrote LH. What's that? Luteinizing hormone. Where did it come from? The pituitary gland again. In fact, the very same place that FSH came from, the adenohypophysis or anterior lobe. But this is a different hormone. LH, LH is what causes the uh, egg to pop out of the ovarian follicle. And now the egg pops out into the fallopian tube. Now a woman can get pregnant. She can't get pregnant as long as the egg's still in her ovary, but if it pops out into the fallopian tube, that's when 
where uh, she can get uh, pregnant. The egg is fertilized in the fallopian tube, if it's going to be fertilized at all. Now, after the egg pops out, we're going to cover all this in more detail, yeah? After the egg pops out, now we call the next remaining two weeks, right, from 14 to 28, uh, we call that the post-ovulatory phase. Post means after, post-ovulatory, after ovulation. It's known as the post-ovulatory or luteal phase. That lasts for about two weeks. LH, the same hormone that caused the egg to pop out, continues to be secreted for two weeks, and it stimulates the follicle cells, which are now called the corpus luteum, to secrete progesterone and some estrogen, and some estrogen. And the progesterone is going to cause significant thickening of the blood vessels, which is called vascularization in the endometrial lining of the womb. Let's go back to page C8. And I'm purposely using C8 because it looks more anatomical. After this, we're going to get to a more physiological drawing. All right, so what happens then, to repeat, is this pituitary hormone called FSH is released for two weeks. And it causes the growth of an ovarian follicle and it causes the follicles to secrete estrogen. And obviously, the follicle cells in the ovaries have FSH receptor sites that uh, when activated secrete estrogen. Then, for beginning around day 14, the pituitary basically stops secreting FSH and starts secreting L. It switches. LH, the first thing it does is it causes the egg to pop out. That's called ovulation. And this LH from the pituitary gland circulating in the bloodstream, now it continues to be secreted for two more weeks, about two weeks, until around day 28. What is it doing now? It's causing the follicle cells. You'd say, what? OK, remember this is called an ovarian follicle. It's the egg with follicle cells. When the egg pops out, we still have the follicle cells, don't we? When we have an ovarian follicle made up of follicle cells without the egg in it, it's called a corpus luteum. So a corpus luteum is the name for an ovarian follicle after the egg pops out. So now it's just made up of follicle cells. LH stimulates these follicle cells. And it causes these follicle cells of the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone and some estrogen. Obviously, now here's the interesting question. How is it possible that LH makes these follicles secrete progesterone when over here we learn that FSH makes those very same follicle cells secrete estrogen? How, how could it be that the follicle cells secrete estrogen here but progesterone here? Yeah, there is a... Uh Gland, they get the, the, the concentration of the LH will affect that. Right, but here's the here's the really the point. These follicle cells secrete estrogen here, but they secrete primarily progesterone here because they're being activated by a different hormone, acting on a different receptor site. These follicle cells have both FSH receptor sites and LH receptor sites. When the uh, FSH activates them, they secrete estrogen. When LH activates the follicle cells, they secrete progesterone. Can cells have multiple receptor sites? Of course they can. Uh, any given cell could have a few different receptor sites. It could have 35 different receptor sites. It could have receptor sites to dopamine, to growth hormone, to insulin, to FSH, to LH, to a whole bunch of things. And each hormone or, or substance will activate a different receptor site and cause a different change, a different effect. So uh, anyhow, uh, we all might also ask the question, what does uh, corpus luteum mean? What, is, what does that mean? <clears throat> the word literally means yellow body. Corpus, <coughs> like a corpse, is a body. Luteum is Latin for yellow. And that's because when you look at this structure with a magnifying lens in the ovary, it kind of looks yellowish. I, you know, I don't know if that's a good reason to name it that, but that's, I'm just explaining how it got the name. What is it? It's just the follicle cells because the egg already popped out. LH is causing these follicle cells to secrete progesterone for the next couple of weeks. We reviewed what estrogen and progesterone did back in section A, around specifically page A11. You don't believe me, look. 
We had talked about how estrogen is the feminizing hormone, feminizing hormone. The progesterone is different. Progesterone, you remember what it literally means? Progesterone? To prepare for pregnancy. Progest, to pro, pro, gest, as in the word gestation. This is the hormone that prepares a woman's body for pregnancy. And the main thing we mentioned back on uh, A11 is it causes a growth of blood vessels in the endometrial lining. The egg has been ovulated. Now a woman who is sexually active could get pregnant. That doesn't mean we know she's going to, she's not. In fact, she might not even be sexually active. But nevertheless, after the egg is pops out, the, uh, the woman's body is designed so that it's going to start getting ready in case that egg is fertilized and an embryo is going to implant. Not, we don't know if that's going to happen at all or not. Might not happen at all because the person's not even sexually active, but this is still going to happen. So the progesterone starts to be secreted into the bloodstream and some estrogen, and that's going to cause growth of blood vessels in the endometrial line. So we've got two things going on now. The egg is moving down the fallopian tube, and blood vessels are starting to grow in the endometrium. That means that if intercourse occurs, that's here, the sperm swim up, swim up into the uterus, swim up into the fallopian tubes, and fertilize the egg. And then we're going to have an embryo that about a week later is going to implant, and there'll be blood vessels here to start nourishing it. This has all got to be set up ahead. You can't find out after you get pregnant uh, after, you know, after the egg has already been fertilized, oh, the, let me start making the, uh, the blood vessels now. You've yeah. got to make the blood vessels before that happens so they're ready to receive the uh, embryo when it implants. So uh, this is the, what causes the blood vessels to form. Now, the LH is going to be released for about two weeks. And so for about two weeks, progesterone is going to be secreted. Uh, if a woman, uh, and then what happens after about two weeks, and if, when did we say LH started to be secreted? Around day 14, that's what caused ovulation. And it will continue to be secreted until about day 28. Now it's about, it might be secreted till day 29 or day 30. It might be secreted only to day 25 or 26. It's just approximate. So uh, after the LH stops being secreted from the pituitary gland, the follicle cells of the corpus luteum start to shrink because what was stimulating them was LH. And as this uh, uh, follicle cell starts to shrink, it becomes known as a corpus uh, albicans. Now, I don't know how important that is. I just wrote here, CL is shrinking. You'd say, what's that? The corpus luteum is shrinking. It's shriveling up. And they call it a corpus albicans. Uh, uh, again, I'm not so important. Uh, feel that you need to know that. Uh, but what does it mean? It literally means white body. <laughs> corpus luteum was the yellow body. This is the white body. You'd say, how do you get that? Corpus means body, like corpse. And albino, albicans, white. Uh, and as this, these follicle cells basically atrophy, and shrivel up, it turns kind of white. That's this thing here. And, uh, and it's not really labeled, but that's what it is and it stops secreting progesterone. Now, when these cells stop secreting progesterone, what did progesterone do again? Progesterone is what caused the blood vessels to grow. You know what happens when it the, uh, the follicle cells stop secreting progesterone in the bloodstream? The blood vessels will be shed. So it's the increase in progesterone that causes the growth of the blood vessels, and it's the drop in the progesterone hormone level that causes their shedding out the vaginal canal. That's called a period or menstruation. You already got that? Yeah. Now, let's, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, back on C9, so on a review on C9 of uh, the female reproductive system, so the ovaries are the reproductive organs that ovulate one ovum each month. The fallopian tubes, also called the uterine tubes or oviducts, are the location where an egg is fertilized. If it's going to be fertilized, if conception's going to occur, the sperm unites with the egg in the fallopian tube, not in the uterus. Uh, the uh, uterus or womb is made up of an inner liner, lining where vascularization occurs. You'd say, what's that? That means the growth of blood vessels and an outer myometrium, the muscular layer. 
Now, what's the menstrual cycle? The menstrual cycle is, lasts approximately 28 days. Approximately. So it's about 28 days, four weeks, one month. Uh, it's, we say it's about 28 days. It varies. Some women, it's uh, 25 days. Some, 30 days. Furthermore, how consistent, how many days it is, each cycle varies in women. Some women are very consistent. 28 days every month. Some 27 days or 30 days every cycle. Probably more women, it's very irregular. 25 days one cycle, 30 days another cycle, maybe doesn't even happen another cycle. <laughs> it's very important for every woman to track how long, track her cycles for about three to preferably six cycles to understand how many days each cycle lasts and how consistent they are. Now, when is day one? When is day one? They, when they wanted, when they were structuring this cycle, they wanted to go and set day one as something where a woman would very obviously know what some point in her cycle. And the point where it's most obvious to a woman is the first day she has her period. The first day she notices menstruation, a loss of, of blood and fluid out the vaginal canal. That's the most obvious. There's nothing else that's obvious. All right? So that the first day that a woman uh, is, starts to menstruate is called day one of the cycle because it's the one thing that is very obvious physically that happens, uh, that manifests itself. Now, uh, uh, how long does the uh, menstruation last? The period, it varies, three to seven days. Uh, how come uh, the menstrual bleeding or uh, period is heavier or lighter? It depends upon how much progesterone there is. Progesterone is what causes the growth of the blood vessels. So the more progesterone, there's gonna be more growth of vessels and a heavier shedding. Less progesterone, less vascularization, less lighter uh, uh, flow. If the cycle lasts 28 days, approximately halfway through the cycle is the approximate date of ovulation. Now, what if a woman's cycle is not 28 days, but 30 days? So when would ovulation be approximately? 15. 15, half of 30. So whatever the cycle is, half of that is the approximate, approximate date of ovulation. But again, it's just approximate. It could be a little bit early, could be a little bit late, and the cycles vary also. Uh, day 28 is the approximate end of the cycle. Could be day 30, could be day 32, could be day uh, 23. Now, but now that we've got those points, so as we had said earlier, the two weeks uh, be, uh, between day one uh, leading up to the date of ovulation are called the pre-ovulatory phase. It's also known as the follicular phase. Why? Because what happens during the first two weeks? The growth of an ovarian follicle. Ovarian follicle. That's why it's called the follicular phase. That's when the follicle is growing. Uh, what is the follicle? Uh, an egg and the follicle cells. On page C11. On C11. So what causes this to happen? Well, it's just magic. No, it's not magic. <laughs> well, it just happens. It, you know, things happen. No, things don't just happen. Everything, according to our understanding of science, things happen because other things happen. There's always a causation, a sequence of events. It is FSH that causes the growth of the ovarian follicle and causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogen. So I know what you're saying next. Okay, then what caused the FSH to be released? We're going to learn that later in the course. It's actually your brain. Ultimately, the brain controls that. And that's incidentally how somebody who is emotionally distraught, it affects the cycling of their, of their body. It can change the menstrual cycle. It could cause the menstrual cycles to stop. All right, and that's how anxiety, fear, stress can affect it because it's controlled by the brain. We'll get to that. But uh, so FSH is causing uh, this growth. And then we have uh, ovulation uh, and uh, how did it happen? Magic, not magic. What caused it was LH, released from the pituitary gland. And, uh, and uh, just before we tell you about the ovulation test kit, and then we'll take a break, uh, well, uh, let's, uh, okay, let me just, uh, let's look at the previous page, C10. On page C10, now, I like this drawing a lot better than the one on C8. 
you'd say, yeah, figures. This is much more clear as far as what's going on. It is. Okay? The other one looked like anatomy. And I was trying to show physiology stuff on how it all works on a static picture of an organ. That's not, uh, we can't, you know, it's like uh, somebody who was asking me in the afternoon class, you know, like, um, you know, why do you use those dead cats to, in a physiology class so we can study physiology of the cats? Yeah, what's, what are we going to watch happen? You know, you watch that dead cat. What's happening? Look at it. Check that heart rate on that dead cat. All right, let's start at the top here. We're going to be learning later that it's really the brain that ultimately controls even the pituitary gland. But for right now, we'll focus on the pituitary. What does this show? The pituitary releases FSH for about two weeks. And then it's going to release LH for the next couple of weeks. Uh, what does FSH cause? It causes an, a little ovarian follicle to grow larger. These actually have names. When it's really little, it's called a primary follicle. It grows, it's called a secondary. As it grows larger, it's called a graphene. I don't care so much that you know that. But this F follicle stimulating hormone is causing the growth of the ovarian follicle. And the FSH causes the follicle cells to secrete estrogens. You'd say, why is it estrogens? Plural. Why isn't it estrogen? Because for those of you interested in say, phar uh, pharmacy, you're going to learn that there are many estrogenic hormones. There's estradiol and estrone. There's a whole family of estrogenic hormones. It's not just one. All right, but anyhow, we'll just say estrogen. Uh, estrogen is the feminizing hormone. Now, what this is showing at the bottom, and it says it right here on the left, is it's labeled endometrial changes during the menstrual cycle. This is showing the relative thickening of the endometrial lining. And it thickens and grows blood vessels. And then, notice what happens here? It sheds. So, this is a really neat diagram. It's basically showing a chain of command. The, the hormones from the pituitary control what goes on in the ovaries. The hormones secreted by the ovaries, estrogen and progesterone, control the uterus. That's how it works. It's a chain of command. The pituitary hormones affect the ovaries. The ovarian hormones affect the uterus. That's really important to understand. You'd say, why? I understand it. So why is it so important? Here's why. Um, the uh, the uh, FSH and LH affect uh, the follicle cells uh, in the ovaries, right? So, uh, and they cause the, uh, the follicle cells to secrete estrogen or progesterone. Their uh, estrogen and progesterone affect the cells of the uterus. In other words, the uterine cells have estrogen and progesterone receptor sites. They do not have FSH or LH receptor sites on the uterus. The ovary cells, the follicle cells of the ovary have FSH and LH receptor sites. Here's the point I'm trying to make and then we'll get, take a break. What if a woman had her ovaries removed? Sometimes that happens, right? Maybe she's got ovarian cancer or something, whatever. She's got uh, uh, other problems, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So her ovaries are removed. Is she still going to have menstrual cycles? No. Even though her pituitary is still releasing FSH and LH, she has, doesn't have any ovaries, so she's not going to release estrogen or progesterone. If she doesn't release estrogen and progesterone, there's no changes in her uterus. It is estrogen and progesterone that causes the thickening and shedding of the endometrial lining. Does everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. So uh, FSH and LH released from, from, the, from the pituitary don't affect the uterus. They affect the ovaries. This is a chain of command. These affect this, and these guys affect this. Yeah? If she's still... Um hormones, what happens to them if she doesn't have Nothing. The, ovaries? Okay. the receptor sites right. are on the ovaries. It doesn't affect anything else. Okay. So that's it. Uh, there's uh, uh, other uh, uh, examples of this. Uh, this is something similar, basically, is true uh, at menopause. At menopause, the woman still has her ovaries, but they stop working. So if the ovaries stop working at menopause, there's no more menstrual cycles. But the pituitary, incidentally, is still releasing FSH and LH even after menopause. 
pituitary component is still working. The ovaries are kind of, the expression is the burnt out. Here's kind of uh, where we left off. Before the break, we had uh, reviewed how the pituitary releases FSH for about two weeks. And it causes an ovarian follicle to grow and it causes in one of the ovaries, and it causes the follicle cells of that ovarian follicle to secrete estrogen hormone. Now, estrogen is the feminizing, feminizing hormone, and it affects many parts of a woman's body, uh, breasts and so on. Uh, it has a slight effect on the uterus. Uh, estrogen will cause some thickening of the endometrial lining, but it doesn't really cause the growth of blood vessels. You'll notice it doesn't show, and I didn't color in any red blood vessels here, but it is causing some thickening. The hormone that really causes significant thickening and growth of blood vessels is progesterone. So that's, uh, that's the hormone that does that. Now, on the bottom of uh, this diagram, this is showing the days of a woman's cycle. And so this is day one, day 14, day 28. Let's make one thing really clear. And uh, I'm going to say it because I know some people actually aren't clear on this. The day of a woman's cycle, each woman has her own biorhythm. There are, uh, today is September 22nd. That has nothing to do with the day of a cycle a woman's on. Because you might think, oh, today's September 22nd, so every, all the women in the universe are on day 22 of their cycle. It has nothing to do with that. Today, September 22nd, there are some women on day one of their cycle, other women on day 15 of their cycle, other women on day 27 of their cycle. <clears throat> and, and each woman has her own biorhythm. Some question that I know somebody's thinking, so I'm going to address it right away, is either it, we have seen that when you have a group of women who are living together, there's sometimes a synchronization of their cycles where they start to be similar. That's probably because of pheromones uh, that are affecting them. And once they kind of separate and they stop like sisters being together in the house, once they go their own ways, then they, oh, their own body cycles on it independently of the other. So then they're not necessarily alike. But uh, basically, fundamentally, uh, the, each woman has her own pattern. So uh, the day of her cycle has nothing to do with the calendar date, you know, on a calendar. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, here's day one of the cycle. And w what is uh, defined def day one? How does a woman know what the first begins? Day the first day of menstruation. And you'll notice here's where it says menstruation. And it's showing a shedding of the endometrial lining. It's actually decreasing the thickness of the endometrial lining. And how, how many days does that last? A few days. Okay, three to three seven, it varies in the woman. So you can see it's showing shedding of the uh, endometrial lining. Now, under the influence of estrogen, there is some thickening of the endometrial lining. Let's look at where it says 14. So approximately day 14, let's uh, follow that dashed line up and notice what happens right here, ovulation. And what caused the egg to pop out? LH. Now, what happens is the pituitary starts to secrete this uh, LH into the bloodstream, and the LH level starts to get higher and higher and higher. They call that an LH surge. And this surge arrives in the LH levels in the bloodstream is what causes uh, the, the egg to pop out. Now, uh, it is this basis, this is the basis of what's called an ovulation test kit. So we mentioned that on page uh, C11. On C11, right after ovulation, I mentioned an ovulation test kit. So I'll explain a little bit about these test kits. They sell all kinds of test kits in the drugstore nowadays. The most famous is a pregnancy test kit, home pregnancy test kit. That's the most famous. We'll explain that one yet today. Uh, but let's uh, talk about the ovulation test kit. The simplest thing to uh, measure is urine. You know, you don't, you don't have to draw blood. So while they do have some kits where you draw blood, the majority of them use urine. The theory behind testing urine is that any chemical that's in the blood, small amounts of it also appear in the urine. This is true for hormones. It's true for drugs. Uh, if they wanted to see, uh, you know, if you're taking uh, any medicine, let's say Tylenol, acetaminophen, uh, it's in your bloodstream, and small amounts will appear in your urine. Uh, it would be true of illegal drugs. If they wanted to know if you're using cocaine, 
uh, they don't have to draw, ask for a blood sample. They could just say, look, I want a urine sample. And if you've got, if you've got cocaine in your blood, you'll have small amounts in the urine. So the same is true for hormones. So the ovulation test kit is designed to test for LH. So here's how it works. These uh, usually, the home test kits are usually either a little test strip that you stick into the urine or some little instrument that you stick in. And it, in this case, it's sensitive to LH and it changes color if there's LH. Now, uh, let's, uh, so here's how the ovulation test kit works. A woman will take a sample of her urine and let's say she takes the sample and she puts this little test strip in and she dips it in and no, it did not change color. So there's no LH. There's no LH in her urine. There's no LH in her bloodstream. The next day, the next day she takes a new fresh sample of urine, a new little test strip, dips it in the uh, urine. No, it still didn't change color. There's still no LH in my urine. There's no LH in the bloodstream. The next day, New fresh sample of urine, uh, a new test strip, dips it in, <gasps> it changed color. There's LH in her urine, that means there's LH in her bloodstream, and what's the first thing that LH causes to happen? Ovulation. So now she knows that she's either just ovulated or about to ovulate, but she didn't have LH yesterday. She's got LH in her body today, so this is around the time of ovulation. Now, why would a woman want to know, you know, uh, when she ovulates? Two reasons. Either she wants to get pregnant or doesn't want to get pregnant. <laughs> because it's after you ovulate, you can get pregnant. So if, uh, if somebody is sexually active and they don't want to get pregnant, uh, they'd say, okay, uh, now that I've ovulated, okay, so I'm not doing anything now, okay, and uh, I'll wait. But actually, the more common use of an ovulation test kit is for a woman to find out when she did ovulate because she's trying to get pregnant. Interestingly, if we uh, just go back to uh, this uh, picture here on C8, <clears throat> the, uh, there's, for two weeks, this ovarian follicle is growing in the ovary. For two weeks. You can't get pregnant when the egg is still inside the ovary. The egg pops out and it's going to travel down the fallopian tube for about a week. That's the week you could get pregnant. Once the egg reaches the uterus, it's already dying. So out of the entire four week cycle, there's really less than one week when a woman can get pregnant. So it's kind of interesting, you could have you know, two individuals who have unprotected sex one time and the woman ends up pregnant. But, that's just the way the you know, odds are, but you can ha there are couples who have been trying to have a child and maybe six months or more have gone by and they haven't been able to uh, 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 conceive yet, right? Have a, a child, uh, to have pregnancy. And this, so the first thing that when they go, when a couple, a woman, whatever, goes to uh, the doctor and says we're having trouble having a, a child, before they start to can do fertility drugs, before they start to do in vitro fertilization, they want to make sure, are you having intercourse at the right time of the cycle? So they're saying, say, get that, go to the drugstore, get that home ovulation test kit, find out when you ovulate. On the day you ovulate, get the guy on the phone and say, get over here right now, all right? And then go at it. Because if they could, let's say that the egg is developing for two weeks in the ovary. Let's say, you know, we're having sex 20 times a day. We've been doing it for two weeks, uh, and, and then we just were exhausted, so we took off for a week. But if, they, if they're having intercourse during these two weeks, when the egg, they can't get pregnant then. So if then they say, you know, we were exhausted, we took a rest for a week, that was the week maybe that the egg is moving down the fallopian tube. So the first thing is to make sure, when did you ovulate? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's who, who usually buys those kids. Uh -huh. How long does the egg stay alive? About one week. About one week. Yeah, and really, truth be told, really, after the egg ovulates, really it's only about three days. So out of the entire 28-day cycle, there's really only about three days. It's a very narrow window. Wow. So that helps explain why we've heard of couples where they, you know, wanting to have a child, and it's been a number of months. And the first thing is make sure you're doing it at the right time of the month. All 
right? So otherwise, it's not going to work. So uh, that's uh, that's the uh, on page C. Where am I? C eleven. So that was the ovulation test kit. Now the post ovulatory phase after the egg pops out. Uh, LH caused the egg to pop out. LH continues to be secreted for a couple of weeks. And it stimulates the follicle cells in what is now called the corpus luteum to secrete progesterone and some estrogen. Progesterone, uh, it, it progest, to prepare for gestation, to prepare for pregnancy, is what really causes significant thickening of the endometrial lining and the growth of blood vessels. That's called vascularization. Also, it is the progesterone that raises a woman's body temperature by about one degree. This is how, you know, because you might wonder, how did we get onto the subject of menstrual cycle? Wasn't he talking about temperature regulation? What did that, how did he, where did he switch off? What did I, was I missing? Because I was explaining that a woman's body temperature changes on a monthly basis based on the timing of, of her cycle. It is when she starts to release progesterone, beginning uh, day 14 to day 28, that her body temperature rises. Here's why. Uh, progesterone is, increases a woman's metabolic rate. All of a sudden, there's increased growth of the endometrial lining. There's growth of blood vessels. This increased metabolism is generating heat. So her body temperature rises. Now, the relevance of this is that before they ever had ovulation test kits, Women would know whether they were in the time of the cycle where they could get pregnant or not based on measuring body temperature. This is known as the rhythm method of knowing when you could get pregnant or not. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain how it works and then I'll tell you a little bit more about why it was used. Uh, the way it works is a woman takes her body temperature every morning, preferably before she even gets out of bed. She keeps a thermometer. So she takes her temperature, right, and writes it down. It's going to be around, you know, 98.6, whatever it is, 98.4, whatever. So she writes it down, all right, and then uh, the next morning takes her temperature. It's about the same as it was yesterday. Uh, and and uh, she does it, and then one morning she's going to wake up, and it's going to be about one degree higher. And, uh, you know, I feel okay. I don't feel sick. It's one degree higher. It's not 98.6. It's like 99.6. All right, so it's about a whole degree higher. That means she's now releasing progesterone. That means she's now in the post-ovulatory phase. That means she can now get pregnant. And it will stay higher for as long as she's secreting progesterone, which is until about day 28. Uh, this was a, this was, method was around before they had the modern ovula, home ovulation test kits. Uh, this is the method that the Catholic Church advocated or recommended, they still do, for uh, controlling when you get pregnant or not. Now, this method still is used today. The ovulation test kit is more accurate. That's more accurate than taking your temperature every morning. But the ovulation test kit is expensive. And this is cheap. So if you've got a you know, couple and they've got seven kids and money is an issue, they're not going to buy an ovulation test kit every month. Mm -hmm. But a thermometer is inexpensive. So on C10 again. So on C10, LH uh, is secreted for a couple of weeks. It stimulates this corpus luteum to secrete progesterone and estrogen, and that causes significant thickening of the endometrial lining and the growth of blood vessels. Approximately day 28, approximately, the pituitary stops releasing LH. So I wrote, when there's no LH, the corpus luteum starts to shrink. Because what was stimulating the follicle cells of the corpus luteum was LH. So when there's no LH, this corpus luteum starts to shrink and it stops secreting progesterone. When it stops secreting progesterone, you get shedding of the endometrial lining. It was progesterone that caused significant thickening and the growth of blood vessels. It is the drop in the progesterone hormone level that causes the shedding of the endometrial lining. That's called menstruation, and the first day that a woman notices shedding of the endometrial lining out the vaginal canal is day one of a new cycle. And so, let me just say this, that's why I said that uh, if, the womb is, the, if the woman's menstruating or having her period, the womb is crying, because it didn't get pregnant that month, obviously. Uh, question? Um, yeah, um, when 
women athletes, mm -hmm. um, it's very common that they either don't have their period. Is that because they're not producing the progesterone? Yes, what happens, remember, ultimately, what did I really say controls this? The brain. The brain. The brain. So uh, th it ultimately goes to the brain. Uh, there's also an issue of body fat. Right. And the idea is, it's kind of, think about it this way. You can almost think in terms of evolutionary theory. Uh, if a woman is so thin in terms of body <coughs> fat that she's not going to be able to support the growth of a baby, basically her system turns off not to get pregnant because she's got to keep herself alive first before she can also uh, have the baby sustain the growth of the baby. So that, that women uh, uh, commonly are, uh, were athletes that uh, become amenorrheic, don't have menstrual cycles. And as soon as they stop that intense training and they kick back and they're not up at four in the morning every morning uh, running uh, and they gain a little bit of weight, then it kicks back in again. <laughs> All right. You're, well, you want to know when it's safe. You want to know when it's safe. Uh, the, the optimal way to get pregnant is around day 14, 15, 16, 17. That, that's it. After that, it's less likely. But less likely doesn't mean safe. What you want is almost a 0% chance if somebody doesn't want to get pregnant. Yeah. So uh, in that case, uh, you really have to wait uh, almost a full week mm -hmm. after ovulation. So uh, 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 seven days after day 14 is day 21. Now, what's interesting about this is the, is the uh, uh, following. Uh, if somebody wants to have a period of s s uh, unprotected safe sex, in other words, they're not going to take any precautions, but they want it to be safe, you either have to do it real early in the cycle, that's when a woman's menstruating, and most couples don't find that's an optimal time to have intercourses when a woman's menstruating. That'll be safe. It's almost impossible to get pregnant during this time. All right, the egg hasn't even started to develop. Or it's uh, pretty safe towards the end of the cycle where that egg has died. But what happens towards the end of the cycle as there's all this release of progesterone, this thickening of the endometrial lining, the growth of blood vessels, the rise in a woman's body temperature and fluid retention is many women feel, quote, bloated and experience PMS, premenstrual syndrome. So in other words, you'll notice that the way the whole body cycle is set up, it's totally safe here, but you're menstruating. It's basically totally safe at the end, but there may be PMS. So what's the time that really seems to work best? Kind of in the middle, where you're more likely to get pregnant. That's kind of how it's designed. Um, what's the correlation to um, fertility drugs to boost the LH and FSH? And usually these women end up having multiple. Oh, because uh, F FSH causes the development of an ovarian follicle. They give a fair amount of it. Look, if a couple's been trying to get pregnant for five years, Right? They've been waiting five years. So they could give them just a tiny, tiny bit of FSH and see if that's enough to cause an ovarian follicle to grow mm -hmm. and ovulate. And they could do that for several months and see if it's going to work. They don't want to wait any longer. So they give them a, quite a bit of FSH. They get multiple ovarian follicles developing, and they ovulate multiple eggs at once. So they always end up with multiple births. Then around towards day 28, the pituitary uh, stops releasing LH, so there's a follow the sequence. There's a drop in the LH level, which causes a drop in the progesterone level, which causes the menstruation. So that's what we wrote on page C11. On C11, if an egg is not fertilized, right, the woman did get pregnant, it, uh, the pituitary gland stops secreting LH by around day 28. I added right here, the CL, the corpus luteum, shrinks, and there's a drop in the progesterone hormone level, and that leads to shedding of the endometrial lining and also a drop in her body temperature. Know that sequence. Understand this, this drop in LH is what leads to the drop in progesterone, which leads to menstruation. Right? There's a sequence, and I've just shown it to you. Now, the next question is, on, the, on, the, on page C13, what if she did get pregnant? Then what? 
If the egg is fertilized in the fallopian tube, I wrote that the embryo implants in the womb, the uterus, about one week after fertilization, around day 21. Let's look at a little picture. Look at C12. On the bottom left on C12, all right, so here's the egg. Pops out at the ovary in the fallopian tube. We said that if the woman has intercourse, the time when she's most likely for that egg's going to be fertilized is right here, around soon after day 14. Could be day 15, could be day 16. And as soon as that egg is fertilized, it's called a zygote, and it's starting to develop. And it becomes a two-celled embryo, and a four-celled embryo, and an eight-celled. And remember, the embryo cannot move on its own. It's being pushed by ciliated cells on the inside lining of the fallopian tube. And it takes about one week for this embryo to be pushed and reach the uh, womb. It, would, it takes about a week for the egg to be pushed. And so if, if fertilization occurs around day 14, maybe day 15, day 16, implantation occurs around seven days later, day 21 of the woman's cycle. Now, what happens when this embryo implants? The outer sac of the baby, and some of you may have learned this in anatomy. If you had me, you did. Uh, there are actually two sacs that surround the baby. There's an inner amniotic sac and an outer chorionic sac. The outer chorionic sac starts to secrete a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. That is secreted by the outer sac of the baby. And that hormone enters the mother's bloodstream. Now, this is a much later stage. This is almost like a full-term baby. But here what it's showing, here's the baby. There's actually two sacs. The outer sac is called the chorionic sac. And they're associated with the chorionic sac. You may have learned in anatomy. There are these chorionic villi. Now, the, this chorion or chorion frondosum or chorionic villi, it all means the same thing, mm -hmm. secretes a hormone called chorionic gonadotropin. It's called chorionic because it's being secreted from this chorionic sac that forms actually the fetal portion of the placenta. This hormone enters the mother's bloodstream and it affects her ovaries. It affects the ovaries of the mother. That's why it's called gonadotropin. You'd say, yeah, why? The word tropin means to affect and the gonads. It affects the gonads. What gonads are reproductive <laughs> organs. What are the reproductive organs of the mother called? Ovaries. It affects her ovaries. It affects her gonads. <coughs> Here I just read there's an inner amniotic hypochondriac. So. Uh, it affects the ovaries of the mother. What does it do? So I wrote what it does on page uh, C13. On C13, so the embryo begins secreting, it's really the chorionic sac of the embryo, begins secreting a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin. HCG causes the corpus luteum to continue <coughs> to secrete progesterone for the duration of the pregnancy. <clears throat> now, if you're thinking, well, it sounds like this hormone, if it's stimulating the corpus luteum, it's doing the same thing LH does. That's right. It does the same thing that LH does. So even though the pituitary is going to stop secreting LH, this hormone secreted by the baby does the same thing as LH from the woman's pituitary. It stimulates the corpus luteum to keep secreting progesterone, keep secreting progesterone, keep secreting progesterone for nine months. Well, then there's not going to be any shedding of the endometrial lining. Didn't we say what causes the shedding is the drop of the progesterone hormone level? <coughs> so <coughs> if the corpus luteum keeps secreting progesterone, it keeps secreting progesterone, the endometrial lining will remain thick and vascularized. Now, <clears throat> incidentally, sometimes women get pregnant, <clears throat> and during pregnancy, they'll experience what's called spotting. There's a little bit of bleeding out coming out the vaginal canal during pregnancy. That's not supposed to happen, because that, if there's bleeding or shedding, then you can lose the pregnancy. <clears throat> uh, that, that uh, if it becomes serious, <clears throat> sometimes it's not serious, 
Uh, if it's serious, then they will increase the amount of progesterone. They'll give progesterone during pregnancy to maintain the endometrial lining and uh, to nourish the embryo so as not to lose the embryo and lose the pregnancy. All right? So progesterone is one of the few hormones they will give during pregnancy uh, to keep that vascularized membrane. So uh, for as long as the, the uh, woman is pregnant and there's a baby inside her releasing chorionic gonadotropin, she continues, uh, that causes the ovaries of the mother to keep secreting progesterone, keep secreting progesterone. There's no shedding of the endometrial lining and the body temperature remains elevated the entire pregnancy. Uh -huh. Is this is the hormone that doctor measures to see if it's it, a pregnancy? Exactly, because what you just said is the very next thing, pregnancy test kit. All right, so that's what I'm coming to. So, the pregnant home pregnancy test kit, right? So we said, we talked about the ovulation test kit. All of these test kits usually are involved in measuring the, something in the urine. So, what, will you, what can you measure that will tell you whether you have a baby or not? Human chorionic gonadotropin. There is no human chorionic gonadotropin in a woman who's not pregnant. It's produced by the baby. So, this is the basis of a pregnancy test. So uh, whether you test the blood or you test the urine, so here's how it works. So a woman takes a sample of urine. They usually have, it's not usually a test strip, it's usually an instrument, a little plastic device you put in the urine. And it changes color. There's a little color, it's, or it's a balloon shoots out, says congratulations. Whatever it is, they have different versions. And uh, uh, yes, and, and so it's, it's going to say, you know, you're pregnant or you're not. So, uh, if basically, if there's chorionic gonadotropin in the urine, you got a baby. If you don't, then you don't. It's about 99% accurate. All right. Now, the way that this usually works, most women nowadays who think they might be pregnant because maybe their period's late, that's usually the first indication. We'll explain that clearly in a moment. But uh, uh, they'll go to uh, the drugstore and get a home test kit to find out first, are they pregnant before they schedule an appointment with the gynecologist, the OBGYN. Once they know they're pregnant, then they'll, they, what you should do, and most do, is they'll contact the OBGYN. They'll do a blood test to confirm it, right, which is a little bit more accurate. And uh, then you either are or aren't. So, uh, yeah. Why do they use that homework? Oh, so yeah, I've been asked that for many semesters now. So they have this new diet method, all right? So they give injections of human chorionic gonadotropin, all right? And they have to be on a 500 calorie a day diet. So I've done research on this. Absolutely a total fake. The human chorionic gonadotropin has no effect whatsoever on weight. Absolutely, there's no documentation anywhere, all right? Anybody who limits their food intake to 500 calories a day, I guarantee you this is a starvation level, will lose weight. You don't need human chorionic gonadotropin injections. The only thing that it could do is placebo effect. You know what a placebo effect is? We're going to give you some injections. They're really going to help you stay on this diet. <laughs> oh, okay. And you know what? 20 to 30% of the people will say, you know, it really works. That works for me. That's the power of suggestion. Because we know that if you had a headache, and you say, I don't have to pretend this class is giving me one. If you had a headache, and I'm wearing a white lab coat, I've got a stethoscope around my neck, right? My name is monogram, so it's MD. And I say, here's a, here's a pill, it's a white pill. Just, this is going to help. You're going to feel better. Do you know that 35% of you are going to say, you know, I, I, I do feel better after I took that. That's called the power of suggestion. That's the only thing that it does. There's no documentation that it has anything to do with weight loss. If you eat 500 calories a day, you're going to eat, lose weight. You don't need any injections. 